everyone. This is Susan Hayward, Step Family Counselor and Coach. And this month's video is going to focus on estate planning for step families. And I'm really thrilled to have with us Patricia DeFonte. Uh, Patricia is the founder of DeFonte Law, a San Francisco based law firm that practices estate planning with heart. Uh, Patricia has received the Super Lawyer designation from the Better Business Bureau two years in a row. She's a published author. author. She is an in-demand speaker and a champion of women and the underserved. So I am really happy to have you revisit us, uh, Patricia. Patricia, you were with us a, a couple of years ago. So thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me back. Thank you for letting me be a nerd about my favorite topic, estate planning. I, I well, we can't have too much uh, conversation about estate planning, can we? No. No, I don't think we can. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bias, but I don't think we can. Okay. So let's go ahead and dig in then. What mistakes do you see that step families in particular make when it comes to planning and drafting their, their trusts and their wills? Sure. So just to, to ease into it, estate planning addresses three things. What about me? What about my stuff? What about the people I'm leaving behind? So one of the biggest mistakes that we'll see is, of course, no planning at all. So let's take what about me? So you have bumped your head and you have this new, let's call them the new spouse, and you have adult children in California, there's no statute that says who's in charge. So who's in charge? This is a grave mistake, not stating exactly who is supposed to be in charge and what they are supposed to be doing. Because of course, the conversations between an adult and their grown children and an adult with their spouse, these are very different conversations. And the perspective that a spouse is probably going to have on end of life and capacity is me very different than even an older adult child. It's really important to have these conversations openly with everyone and to also reduce all of that to a writing to have an advanced healthcare directive. When we think about what about my stuff, is it appropriate? So if you do nothing, the laws of California say who gets what? who gets the community property, who gets the separate property, and in what percentages. It's all there for you in the codes. If you don't like that, then you can opt out. And you can opt out by using a will, which just redirects your assets wherever you would like them to go, to the SPCA or to whomever. Um, but it doesn't keep your people at a court. It's completely public. Everyone will know what you did with your money. And it doesn't really provide any cover for the people that you're leaving money to Everyone who's interested will know exactly who's getting what and in what amounts. The better way <laughs> is to use a trust. And that way you have a lot of decision-making ability, but you also have control from the grave and the people that you're leaving behind, they have privacy. And privacy for a family that may already be fractured is absolutely critical. What you don't need are a bunch of weirdo creditor and predator third parties in everyone's ear trying to figure out how to get more money from the others because they, those predators eventually want the money in their own pockets. That makes so sense. the biggest mistake is a failure to plan. This right. is the number one biggest mistake is a failure to plan. The second is thinking that it'll be fine. Everybody gets along, it'll be fine. Right. It'll be fine. Famous last or, I'm oh, sorry, tell me. Famous last words, right? Yes. Everyone gets along fine. Yeah. Everyone gets along fine. And then there's a, you know, money's a tricky thing when someone has died. And so you may have a new spouse and your children are grown and they're doing great and you're not worried about them financially. Maybe they have more money than you do. But if you die and you don't leave them anything and you haven't told them that that's what's going to happen. <laughs> so I think failure of communicating the plan is enormous, enormous, because you may have this new spouse who is a grandparent to your grandchildren. But if you haven't told your kids about your estate plan, that you feel that they are financially fine, you put them through college, you did all the things for them. And now you're really concerned about your spouse because 
your spouse maybe is looking at uh, major medical because your spouse's health has failed because they were your caretaker, whatever the reasons are, right? Rational, irrational, your reasons. Explain your reasons to people because otherwise all they're thinking is that new spouse did something to my parent. I'm angry and I don't know where to put that. So you have to talk about it. Yeah. So you have to plan something. You have to do something. And you have to talk about what you've done so that the people who are left behind are not left wondering what happened. Why, why didn't I get anything? Or why is it set up this way? Why would this? And, and then it's just recrimination and pain. Yeah, yeah. And, and so how much, you know, I'm big on communication, of course. So how much do you need to communicate? Do you need to talk dollars and cents with your heirs? I think that gets a little bit sticky because dollars and cents change. I mean, we're in a whole new economy where you're worth 25% less than you were yesterday at times. Um, so I don't know about the nitty gritty, but you know, it can sometimes be a little bit more complicated where there's a family house that the kids grew up in, but there's not a lot of liquidity. And you're leaving the surviving spouse the home because it's now their home where they're going to age in place. And so what you're leaving behind is really disparate. And so I think that you have to talk at least in broad strokes about this is the these this is why I'm making decisions that I am. These are the concerns that I have, because the reason that we leave people our assets is because we're worried about their quality of life when we're not around. We want to honor the relationship we had when we were together. We feel bad and we want to make up with it for that with money um, or we have charitable inclinations, right? And so you just have to express this in a really human way. And it's hard because we don't talk about money no. as a, as a community, as a society, yeah. we don't. Right. So by, you know, we don't talk about dying and death and that's part of estate planning is right. Looking yeah. At we, we can't talk about estate planning without somebody dying. Right. Yeah. Yep. There's always, I'd say when my clients work with me, we don't really talk about it until about an hour and 45 minutes into the first meeting, which is two hours long. It's only at that point I say, and now you're both dead. And they go, Oh, well, Hey, we knew it was going to happen. It's estate planning. Right. No, I love when people say, if I die, yeah. Yes. So, so that, that's an indication of, of not being able to face your mortality. So you, you talked about the bad feelings that could happen after estate planning. And we know that stepmoms are often sued um, by their stepchildren, um, the, or the wills are contested, or the trusts are contested. Sometimes it's the stepchildren at the end of the day who sue each other, you know, when both uh, parents die. Mm -hmm. What can we do to avoid that? Communicate, communicate, communicate. So this is America. We can all sue each other for everything all the time. Vexatious litigation is hardly ever, like once you get down to it, hardly anyone is ever actually held liable for that. Everybody likes to sue everyone. And there's so much, so much spite can be involved in any trust in estate litigation that it's not even that I want the money. It's I just don't want you to have the money. And let's give the money to all the lawyers just so that you don't get the money, right? Let's just waste away the estate. And I think that what helps is communication, documentation, communication, documentation, communication, documentation. And, you know, it's really tricky to um, disinherit. So if you think you're not going to leave people anything, then you have left them no incentive to not sue, to not create problems. But if you say, I'm leaving you X, and if you can test this and you lose, then you don't get that, that can be a little bit of a barrier to entry to litigation because people might stop and think, well, I mean, I wanted to get a million, but they left me 500,000. And if I fight about this, I'm probably going to wind up paying my own lawyer and missing out on 500,000. That can steady the boat a little bit. Yeah. Well, you know, and sometimes it's not about the money. It's usually yeah. not, right? It's about and if it's not about the money, there's nothing. I'm not going to say there's nothing you can do. 
I think the critical thing is communication, communication, communication. There are wonderful coaches and mediators who bring people together to talk about these kinds of things. Like, listen, the, your parent is now going to explain why they set up their estate plan the way they did. And you are going to ask every single question. And this is the last time that we are going to talk about this. This is our opportunity to talk about all of this. Let's go. And then you just air everything and get in a big fight then. And then it's done. Hopefully it's so much better to have, but most people don't want to be there for the fight, right? They have this fantasy that when they die, everything, everybody will come together peacefully because I've died and there will be harmony. No, everybody goes to their kitchen, sharpen their, sharpens their knives. And now it's just, you know, this, the stabbing to the death festival. Um, you, you created this situation, right? Your kids did not blend up their own family. Mm -hmm. Your new spouse didn't, wasn't the one who married you to your first spouse. You created this situation. So it's up to you to make sure that all of the players in this game are heard, understood, and communicated with. Yeah, brilliant. So I've heard you say um, that leaving a small inheritance to the children after their biological parent dies is a good idea, not to have them wait until both parents die. And I wondered if you could say more about that. Sure. It's, um, let's see. So generally with a traditional family, I still, I like this idea. I like the idea of one parent dies and we leave, well, sometimes we call them mommy and daddy gifts, mommy, daddy gifts, um, something to the children, the adult children, um, because it's a time where everybody is facing their mortality. Everyone is afraid of the future. And that small influx of cash, $50,000, $100,000, you know, for, um, for a child who's in their thirties, forties, fifties, that's a, that's an enormous amount of money at that time. When you're thinking about trying to save for retirement, trying to pay for college, trying, trying to clear debt, right. Trying to clear your mortgage debt. Um, and it just brings them more into like an adult phase. And you're not only worried about mom and also adult children take time off from work their own health suffers, they're trying to take care of the surviving parent. And so I think that it is a very good idea. Um, when it comes to a blended family, this is not a nice idea. This is necessary. Can't leave everything to the surviving new spouse. And then when that person dies, then it gets distributed among the children because then you literally have a bunch of children with their arms crossed waiting for that person to die. Um, I don't think it's a very nice way for that person to live when everybody's just waiting for them to kick the bucket. And some people think, well, my new spouse is a wonderful person and they will absolutely, if my children need money, give them money. But then you might be creating tax problems, gift tax and income tax, all kinds of sticky things. And you're also making the relationship strange because maybe your kids do love your new spouse. But it's weird for them to ask them for money. It's the same thing of when you think about your elderly parents. Oh, something happened to me. Would my parents come to my spouse to ask for money? Probably not. So maybe we need to leave parents money just in case. Um, you have to think about the people and how they would really react at the time. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's such great advice, Patricia. L let's talk a little bit about executors when it comes to step families too. And again, I have heard some estate planning attorneys say, you know, don't name a family member, especially because it's it's a second family. Um, name someone, a fiduciary that's neutral. Where do you stand on that? Okay. So there's a very lazy way to approach estate planning, which is you name one person who's in charge of everything after you die. This is utter nonsense. If you're only using a will, that's it. You've got one bite at the apple. It's that one person. And that person has to go to court and they have to marshal all your assets and do your tax return and make your tax elections. And they have to pay your debts. And then they just give the money to whoever is listed in your will. And there they are and they're stuck and that's their whole job. Um, when you have a trust, there's more ability to name disparate people. 
anytime someone dies, there's about a year's worth of work that needs to be done. And so the person who's died, all of their stuff goes into what we refer to as the administrative trust. It just kind of goes into a little, almost like a little temporary holding company. And it's within that holding company that this wonderful person who is going to give up a year of their life to do basically taxes on steroids. And it takes a year because they're waiting for all these um, documents from third parties. And they have to wait for the CPA who is waiting on documents. And so it's a whole dance that goes around and around and around of so many people trying to cook up this stew of the administrative trust. And so maybe it's appropriate to have a family member do that. Maybe it's appropriate to have a private fiduciary do that because the family is grieving. And so it's really important to work with the lawyer to figure out for this specific role, what who is the best person for this? And then let's talk about who's getting what. So when it comes to who's getting what, who's going to hand out that money? And if it's just you get some, you get some, you get some, and everybody's just getting their money free and clear and walking away, that's pretty simple. But if it's you get some, but it's going to be held in this trust and you get some and it's going to be held in this trust and you get some and it's going to be held in this trust. Then we have to talk about, well, who's in charge of that money, right? And it can be easy if it's, well, you can be in charge of your own money, but your mom's going to be in charge of your money because you're 13. And, you know, so, but where it gets a little sticky is that it's really common with a blended family that one spouse will die and then the survivor is the beneficiary of a subtrust that they can take money out of it, but the rest of the money goes to the, de the deceased spouse's children. And so there's a conflict there, right? Mm -hmm. Whose money is it and what's it for? And so it takes a lot of care to make sure that you're putting the right person in charge of that trust so that you're not creating a sense where that anybody who's related to this trust is thinking there's something fishy going on. That the surviving spouse isn't thinking they won't give me distributions because the person in charge is my stepson's best friend. Right. That's terrible. That should not be, right? Or the kids are thinking, well, she's just going to blow through the money. Um, and her um, financial advisor that she's had for 40 years, who is the successor trustee, is going to let her because of this pre-existing relationship. So you have to, like everything with estate planning, you walk really, really slowly and you have to work with a lawyer who's asking you all the hard questions. They have to ask you about your ex-spouses, your current spouses, the relationship between the children and all the spouses and who are the other players, who else is around, who do we trust, who's responsible and reliable, who are we afraid of, what kind of professionals do we want? You know, sure, you can hire a private fiduciary, but that comes comes with its own hurdles because then it's just harder for everyone and it's expensive. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that's appropriate and sometimes it's not. And often you need to have a certain level of wealth to even get one to work with you, especially if you want to work with a bank. And so that's not, um, it's not an option that's open to everyone. And especially in some parts of California where we are real estate wealthy, but we're not investments wealthy, um, the banks don't want to work with us because they can't manage our money because all our money is it real estate? Interesting. So what happens then if there's uh, not a great relationship between the surviving spouse and the stepchildren? Um, I mean, is in your interviewing of families, and if there if there's not a great relationship, what 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 does that lead you to advise? Sometimes what we talk about is do we need to have a separate trust? Do we need to allocate some funds to a completely separate trust for the spouse and the children so that the spouse and the children are not getting money from the same vehicle? Because anybody who's listed as a beneficiary in a trust gets a copy of the trust. And sometimes they get accountings and they get all this other information. And so often to protect the privacy of the various parts of the family, we'll do, you know, so, um, I'm the spouse and I have a new spouse. So me as the, as the parent, I'm going to create a trust for the benefit of my children. It has nothing to do with my new spouse. 
and all everything that I want for my children and all the protections and everything. And it's all very personal to them. And maybe there's some really specific loving language. Maybe there's language about substance abuse. Who knows, right? So we're going to do that privately for the kids. And then after I die, my children have privacy from their step parent when it comes to their inheritance. And then they can be another trust set up completely separate for the new spouse. And so it, if you, if you know that it's going to be Thunderdome, you don't have to create Thunderdome. You can separate this. It gets a little tricky in California because we're a community property state. So you have to be very, very careful as to what you're allocating to each trust um, and work with a lawyer who knows what they're doing. But um, it's not impossible. And I think that in some, in some cases, it's imperative. Yeah. And does this depend on how big the estate is? Like, if it's very big, it's easy to separate it and have the surviving spouse live on a portion of what. Right. Yeah, it really depends on what the estate is made up of. And I'm a huge proponent of life insurance because it solves so many problems. It provides liquidity. It's just instant cash, press a button, cash. And I have absolutely written trusts where the only asset for this trust was a life insurance policy that would pay into that trust when the person died. And it can be a really terrific mechanism, a really great mechanism. And I've written plans where the um, where both of the spouses had prior marriages, prior children. So they have their trust together and that holds their community property real estate and they're taking care of each other you know, their marital assets as they grow over time. But then the trust that they've created for each set of children, those are funded with life insurance and it's pure cash. Wow, interesting. And, you know, what I remember with one of them, he had uh, adult children. And so his trust looked very different than his wife's trust because she had minor children. And so having all of this within one document would have been an enormous invasion of privacy for them both sets of kids and then the guardians and the successor like it just would have been a big big mess and so we we needed to take it apart and um and honor all the relationships and keep things reasonable for the people who have to deal with this on the back end yeah yeah so so that leads me to the next question i have about revisiting uh trusts um every so yes. often and does that depend on how well the children are doing? I'm talking about adult children. You know, uh, if one of the children is very successful and the other is struggling, you know, how do you factor all that in? Or do you? Sure. So you have to see your estate planning lawyer every three to five years. You cannot create an estate plan and then throw it under your bed and let the dust bunnies get it. No, you might think everything is fine. And maybe everything is fine. But what you probably don't know is what Congress has been up to, what the California legislature has been up to, what a judge in Fresno has been up to, and what California voters have been up to. You have to see your lawyer every three to five years. And during that meeting, the lawyer should be asking you a lot of tough questions about your taxes and your insurance, your financial advisor, making sure that the team around you is steady, still very, very involved. Because as time goes by, we have to make sure that both spouses are locked in with all of those advisors. Because if you bump your head, well, what's your partner or your spouse supposed to do? It's a mess, right? We're always looking at what's fair, what's equitable, right? Fair and equitable, totally different meetings, right? A lot of people used to say, and still say, everything to my kids in equal shares. Okay, but it's not apples and apples, right? If you have a piece of real estate and you leave it to all of your kids, well, they're not all gonna own it together. They'll, that's terrible, uh, mostly. <laughs> Most of the time, that's a bad idea. And what they're gonna wanna do is buy each other out or one of them's gonna wanna sell it, the other one can't afford to buy it, but it's a mess. And so you have to address these things head on. You have to tell the kids, look, you became a doctor and your brother is an artist and we respect that, but you don't need our money, your brother does. And so we're giving him the house. And so he'll he'll always have that because that provides stability for his family. You have your own house, just talk about it. Just keep talking about it. Um, sometimes time will go by and you will lose a child, but their, their spouse is still alive with your grandchildren. So you have to think about 
you know, my plan says to my children, but if my children are deceased, then to my grandchildren, is this still appropriate given that you've lost your child, but their other parent is still alive? Maybe you want to take care of that person. So you're all, you always have to keep looking at all of the people and all of the stuff and matching things up in a way that also works with the taxation of real estate and retirement accounts, <laughs> all the things. It's a comp, you have to do the full analysis every three to five years. Yeah. And I would imagine that doesn't always go down well when you say, you know, you don't need the money, but your sibling or your step sibling does. Um, that might be a hard pill to swallow. I think in step families, it's harder. Um, I think a lot of the times it's harder because the younger generation in a step parent situation is usually a, a wealthier group. Just because if you first got married when you were in your 20s, you probably broken, busted like most people in their 20s, right? But then you get married again, you start building a family in your 40s, early 50s. These are your high earning years. And so it's that kind of stuff is really difficult. And I think that's where a counselor is really, really important. What you do is critical. Um, and just being very open with your adult kids. Look, I have little kids. <laughs> I have responsibilities here, huge ones. And everything's more expensive now than when you were little, or I get that it feels strange for me to do this. And it would be quote unquote fair for me to just do everything at a clear percentage. But this is not, these are not my values. I didn't raise you that if I gave you a guitar, I gave all of your siblings a guitar. This is not Oprah Winfrey giving away cars. I'm looking at people I love deeply and trying to make the best decisions for them. If you don't agree, you don't agree. And we can talk about your feelings, but I'm not going to change my mind because I think what I'm doing is important. Like, you know, stand your ground and listen and stand your ground. Interesting. And I love what you said about fair, being fair and equitable. Can you unpack that a little bit more? So what is the difference? Yeah, I think that people think of fair as equal percentages. Yeah. Everybody gets the same. If we're paying $50,000 for you to go to college, then you only get 50,000. Or if you get a scholarship, I'll give you 50,000, right? Everything fair, 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 fair. And every once in a while, I work with clients who want to true up their inter vivos gifts, what they give away in life before their kids get anything on death. But it's really, really rare because most people don't operate on a day-to-day -day by what's fair. Most people operate on equitable. What do your children need? What do you want to do for them to help them build their life, right? We're paying a lot of money for this one to go to college. We're going to give the other one some money to buy a house, whatever. But we're not looking at the actual dollar numbers, right? We're just being parents and we're helping where we can. Um, so it's always interesting to me that even though you've lived your life in an equitable way, on death, it's this you know, pro rata shares. And um, once we really get into the discussion, pro rata shares tend to melt away. I didn't ask you all these questions about how all your kids are doing and how much money they make and where do they live and what how, what is their quality of life because I was just curious. It's because we have to come up with a plan that is suitable for your family, which is why you should never work with an estate planning lawyer who says, what do you want to do? That's like, that's like working with a tax person that says, how much tax do you? It just doesn't make any sense. You have to work with somebody who's really going to get to know you and ask a lot of questions about the people in your life and who you're trying to take care of. And then we can get down to the bottom of matching up the assets to the person and honoring everybody, taking care of everybody. Yeah, you know, that is so tricky, Patricia. I mean, I'm just thinking it is. because <laughs> people equate, you know, money with love. And mm -hmm. so it's not, they may not need the money, but they do need the love. Yeah. To which I say, why don't, why don't we just take a five minute break and you call your kids and you tell them you love them. If you could just express that you love people more frequently, they will not flip out when you die. I think yeah. it's helpful. Yeah. And I've had clients absolutely laugh and I'm like, no, just do it. I'm, I'm taking a five minute break. I encourage you to use this time to like, just send a a text to all your kids and just tell them you love them. Yeah. Just do it. So, and it's strange how some people are like, that's so weird. I'm like, I don't know. I text my parents like that all the time. 
So, you know, the, the next question I have kind of ties in with this, Patricia. So I, I know that some stepchildren worry that their step parent uh, is going to squeeze them out at the yeah. end after their, let's say their father dies yeah. and that they're no, they're not going to be getting anything because they're going to sure. be written out. Um, so could you explain, this is a really baffling concept between the revocable trust and the irrevocable trust. And what does that mean for the heirs? Okay. So Gen hmm. Okay, so a, a revocable trust can be changed over time. So if your parent has a new spouse and they have a revocable trust, that means that when your parent dies, the new spouse can probably just do whatever the heck they want unless that trust says that a certain amount of money goes into an irrevocable trust. And that irrevocable trust might be for you, but it might be for the step-parent and then for you. So it's kind of what we were talking about before, putting the right people in charge. I think it's important to have that conversation openly with what the intent is here, because often the intent is some of it's going to go into this irrevocable trust. And I really don't care if my new spouse spends all of it because long-term care is, is expensive. Getting old in America is expensive and I want to provide for them. But other people craft this irrevocable trust to say, my new spouse can dig into this money after they've depleted their own funds and or only for healthcare and like support and maintenance, keep the lights on as a safety net. And so we, this irrevocable trust can be created in different ways. And so just saying it's an irrevocable trust so I know I'll get money, not necessarily because there can be an irrevocable trust that is for your new spouse's comfort and support. So off they go on their around the world cruise if they want to, because they can't under the terms of that trust. Um, again, it's the talking, you gotta get everybody talking. And if you're not talking, cause everybody hates everybody, the writing, the writing of everything down, give, some, give your people something to be mad at other than your new spouse, um, give them, something to talk to that's like, even if it's a piece of paper, maybe it's not a lawyer, right? They may not agree with you, but if you express yourself, they know where your head was, right? They won't know that you watched your best friend lose his spouse and then really suffer economically. And you're afraid that if something happens to you, that's what's gonna happen to your new spouse. You're terrified of leaving your new spouse in a position where they have to live in a nursing home that's operated by the state. And so that's why they're leaving them all the money. You don't know what an older person's fears are. And so you really, the older person needs to express them and the younger person needs to be open to understanding. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I know someone who has decided uh, that he's going to have a revocable trust and it's a second marriage. And that the reason is because if his kids don't treat his spouse well, their stepmother well, she can decide not to leave them any money. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of a threat, isn't it? <laughs> it's a big threat. And uh, I have not had that client. I don't know anybody who's done that, but that's really interesting. Um, I don't know that I want to buy someone's affection, but I get it because it might be that these kids are incredibly aggressive and um, to the point of maybe even elder abuse. And so I think that can be an incredible mechanism to keep them at bay and to allow her access to the grandchildren because she probably very much feels that those are her grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And so they're not going to cut her away from all that love and devotion and all that important hugging of young children, which is just something we all want to do all the time. It's cute. Um, you can't take somebody away from, you can't take the family away from the new spouse, right? It's cruel. So that's a really fascinating, interesting tactic. I haven't had anyone ask me for that, but I see it. Yeah, I get it. So the other case I wanted to ask you about, and I, I may have already told you about this one. It was, it's a friend of mine 
who was sued by her stepbrother after her father died. Mm. Um, because the father, and I think this is a communication issue, the father decided not to leave anything to his stepchildren. That they had not to leave been, anything to the to the stepchildren. No, that he had, they had already been taken care of when their mother died. His his spouse, his second spouse. Yeah, and of course, this one of the stepbrothers sued my friend. Of course, and it was a small amount, Patricia. Um, and he lost. Yeah, it's brutal, and I have had that client. I, I'm not going to leave them anything because their mom's taking care of them. And I, I have yet to have a client stand, like refuse to move on that. You know, first of all, you don't know what's in your ex's estate plan. Second of all, it's none of your business. Third, that's what they did for your children. This is someone else doing something for your children. What are you doing for your children? What message are you sending to your children? Um, I think it's really damaging and, um, you know, to do that, especially without discussing it first and without having more to say about it, look, your mother left you really a lot. We, I have this really deep other concern, health, whatever, you know, whatever it is, talk about it. But if you just, to me, the messaging is, well, you know, clearly your mom lo loved you more than I did, or I'm so lucky that I outlived your mom. So I don't have to leave you anything. It, I mean, I, I'm not even in this situation and this is how I'm taking it. Right. It's cruel. Mm -hmm. And it has gone on to destroy a sibling relationship. Right. Right. And well, then you, you leave, you're leaving the children in this awful position of, well, I guess dad loved me more. Like, really? Is that, that's, not generally the way people think unless they're weirdos in a movie. So, you know, you always have to think about family harmony, family harmony, family harmony. The tagline for my practice is estate planning with heart. And that's why we spend so much time learning about our clients' families. Fine, you don't wanna leave any money to your son. How's he gonna feel sitting outside in his car by himself when the rest of his siblings are in with the lawyer talking about the inheritance. How does it feel to be excluded? How does it feel to not be a member of the family who's processing grief along with going through the trust admit? Like it's a shared communal experience and you're just going to cut this one out because they have enough because their mom died. That's, that's some reprehensible nonsense. I don't like it. Yeah. There's just, I only work with people I like. This is very complicated stuff, Patricia. Yeah. It is. But I think a lot of times you just have to get over yourself. You just have to stop thinking that you can control everyone and you can determine what's fair and you can't, you have to stop looking at this, these end of life gifts as something that you're giving and you have to look at them from the perspective of the people who are receiving them and that you don't want, you the whole life that you build up to descend into chaos when you're gone. You have to take yourself out of the equation. And so finally, um, if you don't want to have a conversation or in addition to a conversation, should you draft some kind of letter to your children and say, this is what's going down? Yeah. yeah. Here's the why. Here's why I'm doing it this way. This is, I would, um, because estate planning for blended families can be tricky and you may not understand all the mechanisms that the lawyer is using. Like I didn't talk about any of the mechanisms. I didn't get into the weeds about the different names of things because it doesn't matter for this conversation, um, but it can get technical and difficult. And so I would ask that you share it with the lawyer so that you're not inadvertently really saying some nonsense <laughs> as you're trying to explain the law. I would stay away from explaining the law and just explain where I am in my heart. And also a really good estate plan will include within the plan, a statement of your intent. And if you are disinheriting someone right there within the body of the trust, this is why, or I don't want certain people to serve as my trustee and here's why. Um, and it's trust and estate litigators who love having that language in a trust because that can stop a lawsuit in its tracks. But I knew exactly what I was doing. My lawyer wrote this. Silence, yeah. peanut gallery. <laughs>
Yeah, well, that's a second good guessers. Yeah, that's a good tip. So now, is there anything I should have asked and, and neglected to do so as it relates to step families? Because I know you have a lot of experience with them. With you us. know, I've talked a lot about the scenario where the um, where everyone is an adult. I think it is really tricky also when there are very young children, um, because we also have this other parent usually in the mix. And sometimes we have two other parents in the mix. And so it's really important to talk about a scenario where the new spouse is not the parent of these young children. What happens when the parent dies? They're going to go live with their other parent. Um, so what is, how do we support that parent financially? And so, because of course there's the money for the children, but now you have maybe a single parent who you are paying a support, you're going to pay half or half a college, like you're there, right? You're co-parenting and all of a sudden that's gone. And so there's, there is this third person in that relationship and that blows people away. And it makes the new spouse very, very angry because they're so resentful already of this other young person that used to be sleeping in the bed next to their spouse. And so they're really tricky, delicate conversations but always looking at it from the perspective of the people left behind, right? And one of the great things that we do at my firm is we do a very long form nomination of guardians. And I tell the client, look, I want you to give this to your co-parent. And what that does is it leads to more estate planning because the co-parent will get jealous and they say, I'm gonna get a better plan than you. And what that does is it protects the children. It, it just, protects absolutely everyone and gets everybody thinking in the same way and out of their own me, 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 my emotions, me, 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 and focused back where they need to be focused, right? On kids. And so the, so the next question I have for you is how, when should people start working on their estate plan? At what age? Oh, so everybody needs a plan as soon as you turn 18. Why? And it doesn't mean that you need a big binder with 500 pieces of paper in it. It doesn't. It means that you need probably a very short form will and an advanced healthcare directive and a durable power of attorney because young people, I don't know if you've noticed, but um, they don't make the best decisions all the time and they wind up incapacitated quite frequently, um, usually temporarily. I remember sitting with a good friend of mine and she told me that her college age daughter was off ice climbing. And I said, well, ice climbing, I hope you have her advanced healthcare directive handy. And my friend, who is very sophisticated, um, said, oh, my gosh, we just saw the estate planning lawyer last week and we didn't even talk about that. Nobody brought that up. Like, well, you need these for your young adults, right? Because if you have young adults in your house, you can't talk to their employers, their universities. You can't do anything for them. You don't have health care authority. Um, so that's a big trigger. Um, your first significant relationship, right? Getting married thinking about getting married, thinking about buying a house, big, big, big triggers. Uh, so it's not an age thing. Estate planning is not for old people and it's not for rich people. It's for all people. If you think about your spouse gets deported, but all their money, all of your money is in a bank account with their name on it. You need a power of attorney. You are in a very significant relationship and your person slides, you know, traumatic brain injury, they're in a coma. And there you are standing across their body, staring at their mother. You, Who's in charge? I don't know. Doctors don't know. Nobody knows, right? What's what's the best thing to do? Nobody knows. Um, if you have a house and that's really what you have and you don't have a trust in California, no one's going to have that house by the time the probate is over because it's so expensive and it takes so long and it's so problematic. So it's not a matter of um, having a certain amount of money or reaching a certain stage of you know, maturity. This is something that you kind of start when you're really young and then you just keep an eye on it, keep an eye on it and see when you need to level up certain documents, when things need to become more complex. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. And how should people get in touch with you, Patricia? Sure. Well, my QR code there should work, and that should take you directly to my website. If you Google estate planning with heart or you Google uh, 
Defonte. Well, the first Defonte that will come up are uh, distant cousins who own a um, deli in Brooklyn, but then I come up right after them. Um, and my firm, we're based in San Francisco, but we do everything on Zoom and we work with clients all over California. And uh, my firm is me and I have two terrific associates who live down in Southern California and our support team are all military spouses. So polite and organized. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. I mean, we could go on and on and maybe we'll do another follow-up, but uh, I have learned so much personally and um, I appreciate all your, your knowledge and your skills. Thank, Thank you. you so much for everything that you've done to enrich my practice. I've learned so much about what it's like to be that stepmother and what the step, what the concerns of a stepmother are just from spending time with you. And I think that's an important part of finding a good estate planning lawyer is ask them who their friends are, ask them who they spend time with, because being able to spot not just legal issues, but real practical issues so that you can get the answers that you need out of a client to draft a plan that makes sense. It's so important. I didn't know that I needed a coach who works with stepmothers but I did. And I'm so glad to know you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Patricia.